welcome to Clock Tower Game Studios. Today we're going to be finishing up the Koan build for the Neo Nagoya project. As you can see in the background there, I'm taping up the windows that we put in in the last video so that when I get ready to prime and paint this, I don't get any on those nice clean plastic sheets that I'm using to simulate the glass. So here I'm just using some, I believe it's duct tape, uh, painter tape, and I'm just carefully uh, placing it over the window frame. I'm trying not to let it stick to the clear plastic and I'm gonna go back in with my hobby knife afterwards and trim this down to size so it fits nice and flush over the uh, frame itself. I don't want it hanging over because I intend to take this out and spray prime it after I get done with the taping. As you can see when I'm cutting away the excess tape I'm being careful not to actually score or get into the cardstock on the outside of the foam core. I just want to get as close to cutting through the tape without scoring or cutting any other material as I can. Once I had the windows taped up, I decided I wasn't done detailing the exterior of the building just yet. I decided to add a few more touches to the railing, and then I decided before I painted it, I wanted to actually get the uh, concrete pad and the AC units that'll sit on that concrete pad and on top of the roof. So here you can see I'm just taking around toothpicks and I'm using those to kind of make corner supports for the railing. So I'm just super gluing those into place. I've got one end cut flat, uh, the other end I'm just leaving stuck up for now while I get them into place. It gives me a little more to work with besides just having, you know, just the length I want. I go back later and I cut these off flush with the top of the uh, the top of the railing. But for now, I, I just left them poking up so it'd be easier to work with and to make sure I knew where I was at on the work. So before I got outside and spray primed, I also decided I wanted to get these AC units added to the rooftop, like I said. So these are just 3D printed parts that I found on Thingiverse. I'll try and find them again and put the link in the description below. But first things first, I wanted them to sit on a concrete pad because I had the idea to make this a rooftop garden. So I wanted them to sit above the grass and whatever other turf I decided to put on there. So here I'm just cutting and losing my hobby knife blade, but here I'm just cutting out a, a small pad. I kind of eyeballed it. I'm not really measuring this. I'm just going with what feels and looks right. I, I know how big the uh, rooftop itself is. I know where I want to put them. So here I'm just using my square because I want to make sure that my uh, platform that I'm putting them on has a good right corners. So as I'm doing that, I'm just carefully cutting it out and then I'm going to move on to gluing the AC units to the pad and I'm going to just use super glue for that. As you can see, I'm just running a bead of super glue all the way around the uh, hollowed out underside of the AC units and I'm just kind of eyeballing it and sticking them into place where I want them. Now I am trying to center the pair so they match up and line up on the pad. And then eventually this pad will get glued to the uh, rooftop of the second floor. So here I'm just gonna finish up. I'm just using some dots, I'm kind of smearing it in with a toothpick at the end of there. And then I just plop it down into place. Before I got to uh, gluing down the platform though, I remembered that I need to cover up the uh, drain holes from where I 3D printed the model. Uh, for the AC units. So what I'm doing is I'm just taking a couple quick measurements and then I've got a piece of cardstock. I'm just going to cut some um, little panels to go over those holes to hide them and blend them in and make them look like they're just access panels. That way uh, it still fits the theme and it covers up the kind of unsightly drain hole that I missed. So here I've got the cardstock cut down to size and I'm just going to go ahead and get it attached with super glue. Now I'm just spreading it around straight out of the container and I'm gonna be careful not to make too big of a mess with this because I'll have to go back and clean it up later. So here I just get the glue on a little bit on the model itself and then a little bit more on the cardstock around the edges. I wanna be careful not to get, like I said, too much on here. I don't want it to squish out around the edges and leave nasty marks whenever I press it into place. This is just to kind of make sure that the corners stay down and it doesn't curl as the glue cures. So here, I'm just gonna get that into place. And once I've got that set up, I'm gonna move on to the next step. All right, now that I've got those cut and glued into place and it's set up, I'm gonna start getting the uh, AC units and the pad there on positioned exactly where I want and glued down. So here I'm dry fitting it and I'm making a couple marks to help me get it positioned again after I get the glue on it. I'm just using a pencil, kind of drawn in the center line and making a matching mark on the pad itself so I can line them back up whenever I'm ready to glue them into place. 
just making sure that I can see that and it's nice and square. And then I'm gonna go ahead and move on and get it glued into place. I used super glue for this off camera, of course, because I'm a klutz like that. But anyway, I just got the glue on there and then I'm using my mark I had to square it up and push it into place. And once I've got it set and positioned where I want it, I double check it, make sure everything's fine. And then I'm gonna go ahead and use a toothpick after I get it squished down into position. I'm gonna use a toothpick and go around the edges and clean up any excess that's squeezed out from underneath the uh, layer of uh, foam core and from around the edges of the um, AC units. And now that that's out of the way, I'm getting a little bit closer to being able to actually go prime. And the glue that I used for these supports on the railing has had time to set up and cure completely. So I'm just gonna go around and use my flush cutters and go around the railing one by one and carefully cut these off just as flush to that uh, upper end edge of the railing as I can get them. Now let's take a look at the finished structure before we move on to priming it. As you can see, everything's been cleaned up, glued into place, and this was the finished building as far as the interior and the structure itself went. So we've moved outside now, and I'm gonna just uh, use some Armory white spray paint that uh, I picked up a long time ago, and I'm just gonna take careful slow passes over this from about a foot away after I've shaken the can very well, and I'm just gonna take my time and make sure I get every nook and cranny that I can. Um, I've got a glove on to help prevent uh, any kind of overspray getting on my hands. Sometimes I don't worry about it, but I've been busy doing other stuff that uh, I need to keep my hands clean for. So this is a, a slow process, uh, mostly because I chose white. If I'd have used a different color, I probably could have got a lot quicker coverage and made it a lot faster to get taken care of. Um, so that was kind of a trade-off here is I wanted it to be a light color on top and painting over a dark color is a lot harder than it is to paint a dark color over a light color uh, for your primer. So that's why I chose the white primer here. And once that's finished, I move on to actually painting the model. So I've chosen an apple barrel pavement as my base color for the lower level. Uh, I wanted it to be darker to stand out from the light uh, sidewalk and pavement color that I'd chosen and used previously because I wanted it to tie in with that. Um, so here I just use one of my big junk brushes. I just get the brush a little bit wet, wipe most of the water out of it because this uh, the hobby paints like this from Walmart or other department stores are always a little bit thick. So I water them down just a little bit so they'll go on a little smoother. But there you can see I've got just a little glob of it on a paper plate and I just start painting it on. Now I want to be careful to avoid painting onto the uh, cardstock trim that I put on in the last episode, even though it's inevitable and you're going to get some on there. But the more I can avoid adding any extra paint to that, the more I can avoid having to go back and touch it up. And that white especially will stay smooth better if I don't have to touch it. Sadly, I get a little messy and I end up having to do a lot of touch up work, but that's just part of it. So here I just go around and I paint the entire bottom level with this pavement, like I said. And once I had that base coat on, I decided I'd go through and start base coating my metallic details for the exterior of the building. So here I've got the vending machine, uh, the ladders and the trash can, and I decide I wanna give these a base coat in black because I'm gonna paint over them with a metallic silver, uh, but I don't want them to be bright, shiny silver. I want them to be kind of hammered metal looking, you know, they've got some wear and some mileage on them. So I want the base coat to be this black color. So I'm just painting it on. I'm pretty sure this is just apple barrel black. Um, it's just another craft paint and I just paint it on and a nice coat, make sure I get all the crevices and get as much around it as I can and uh, take care of all the detail bits this way. Once that's all wrapped up and I've got those base coated, I move on to doing a rain gray coat for my base coat on the um, concrete pavement for the driveway and around the edges of the building. So here I'm just doing the same thing. I get a little bit on my paper plate. I use my wet brush and I just go around and smooth some of this across the entire surface. I uh, take my time, make sure I get every bit, and I try to keep it clean around the base, although it does get a little bit sloppy around the edges of the um, of the trim there on the first floor. But you can see this starts to pick out some of the details that I carved into and cut into the um, 
the foam core for the base level to give it sort of a worn concrete look. I've got cracks and dings and a little bit of uh, breakage around the edges. And this is the first step that you can really start to see some of those uh, detailed features. Once I've got the top surface of the pavement done, I go around and carefully using the same color, get around the edges and make sure it matches. Now this is important because at least some part of this is going to be visible on the game board sometimes. Um, the base itself will warp a little bit over time. Uh, it'll poke up outside of the sidewalk. That'll be the lip that is supposed to contain the little pad that it sits in on the game board. But uh, this step kind of helps ensure that it's not terribly jarring when it does. You won't see the white raw edge of the foam core. This is just kind of an attention to detail thing to sort of help blend it in later on when it's actually being used on the game table. Here you can see I've already gotten started painting the glass features of the hover car using Midnight Blue from Citadel. Um, this is the hover car from Titan Forge uh, Miniatures. It was part of their uh, Cyberpunk uh, March Patreon campaign. Um, they've been nice enough to let us use their stuff. So here I'm just carefully painting all of the glass features on the roof, the windshield, the doors, painting it all that midnight blue color just to help bring it out and make it look like darkened glass. And I went ahead and moved on to painting the lower half of the vehicle black color because this is supposed to be a police vehicle. So I wanted to help give it that iconic look by having the upper half of the vehicle be stark white and then the lower half be the pure black. And I'm just using the black apple barrel hobby paint for this. This isn't supposed to be like a award-winning tabletop quality uh, showpiece for a centerpiece of an army. This is just supposed to be terrain. So it doesn't need to stand out and be the center of attention on the game board once it's finished. However, I do want it to have enough life and detail to it so it stands out and looks good on the battlefield. I don't want it to be, you know, just a piece of trash or a Hot Wheels car or whatever on the board. I want to give it some attention, make it look nice, and make it kind of help fit the whole theme and feel that I'm going for for the game board. And now, as you can see, this is one of the disadvantages to using uh, 3D printed parts. You can see on the bottom side of the model there where I've kind of helped hide it because I know how the build's going to be, but this model, uh, the print didn't turn out very well and it's on my fault, uh, not the company. The model itself is gorgeous. Um, however, I'm still relatively new to 3D printing and I still run into issues from time to time. So um, the settings I used to print this weren't great. And so there's a lot of scarring and pock marks on the bottom where my support settings were bad. Sometime I'll maybe go over a 3D printing video and go into a little more depth on that. But I just wanted to point that out and make sure that, you know, this isn't a perfect model by any stretch of the imagination but it's good enough for what it's for. And that's something to keep in mind is when you're building terrain, especially as opposed to like your actual army, um, things can be a little more sloppy and a little more haphazard. You want them to look good, but they don't necessarily need to be perfect unless you're you know, competing in an event or something of that nature, or maybe putting up a, di a display board at a store or a club. This, that's not what this is for though. This is eventually gonna be used for demos. It's gonna take a lot of abuse so it really doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be good enough and it needs to be a little bit durable. So this big chunk of heavy 3D printed resin will hold up well to game abuse, but it doesn't necessarily end up with the detail that I wanted as far as the uh, overall quality of the print. Um, I wouldn't be happy to run this as part of my army. However, that said, I am very happy to run it as part of my terrain, and I'm looking forward to uh, using more of their models for this. Uh, like I said, this is a Titan Forge model. Um, they're also responsible for the uh, furniture and all that that went on in the interior of the building in the last video. But anyway, moving on. So while I was waiting on the car and for the building itself to dry, I decided to step back and go back to the detail bits. So here I'm starting with the ladders. I'm using an apple barrel yellow and I decided to paint both the ladders this bright safety yellow uh, because it, I want them to stand out. I want them to be visible on the battlefield as like, hey, look over here. Here's a way to the next level. Uh, since the interior of the building isn't playable, that's important. Uh, ladders in Seer do have a different mechanic. Uh, some models can go up them. Infantry models obviously can climb a ladder while, say, a cavalryman or a tank can't. 
Um, so it's, it's good that these should stand out and be visible on the game board from a distance. Next up, I bounce back to the building and I start with a country gray uh, on the underside of the spots where the second floor overhangs the ground floor. I want to do this because I don't want any stark white on the model other than where I purposefully put it, such as around the trim bits. I wanted it to have at least some color on all of it. So here this is going to help kind of darken in those undersides, uh, give them a little bit of a shadow. It's also going to help keep the model with a more tidy, clean appearance. And um, I had an issue here where my paint had sort of dried on the palette and it left sort of clumps. So I ended up having to fight with that a little bit for this. And I ended up switching to a different container of paint, I believe. But anyway, um, the same thing applies to all of it. Uh, just get your brush a little wet. Uh, don't have it soaked, but have it damp. Um, keep your actual paint you're using to a good consistency where it flows nicely. Don't let it get clumpy. Don't let it get to the point where it runs like a wash. Somewhere in between where you're comfortable with it and you're getting good coverage and just go through and be careful and paint it on. And I do that not just around the bottoms of the ledges here, but I go through and I do um, the entire second floor in this color as well. So while I've got that country gray out, I'm gonna go ahead and jump on getting the um, pavement dry brushed to help bring out that texture and make it look more like concrete. So I've got my makeup brush here. Um, it's uh, Wet n Wild, I think, is the brand of it. It doesn't matter. You can pick these up at any drugstore for fairly cheap or get them at you know, any department store. So this is a dry brush again. So I'm just trying to wipe most of the uh, wet paint off of my brush. And then I just go through and kind of circularly dab on the paint. It's going on a little thick, but that's okay. This is going to get a really heavy wash over it. And this is to help texturize and bring out more of the carved in uh, pavement details like the cracks and crevices and breaks that I've put in it. So as you can see, this is really helping those pop out. I'm getting a little sloppy around the base, but at this point I've already noticed that I've made a lot of mess. So I know I'm gonna have to go back and touch that up anyway. At this point, I figured the best bet is to just go around, make sure I get the pavement how I want it, and I can worry about going back and touching up the trim later. And later has come. Now I'm gonna go back around where I've made a mess with the other colors and I'm using uh, Apple Barrel Hobby Paint, uh, just their pure white. And I'm going around and touching up all of the spots where painting either the AC units or the actual sides of the building or the pavement where I got a little carried away. So here I'm kind of putting on a thick coat. I'm trying not to leave brush marks that are too noticeable. And I'm trying to kind of feather that out into the rest of the white. Um, this is really difficult. Painting white cleanly is really a challenge on even a well-prepared, well-finished and primed model, like a miniature, on cardstock with the paper kind of texture and the amount that it soaks in. It's really hard to get a smooth finish on this, but just do your best. Um, I could have also uh, gone over this with uh, Mod Podge uh, before priming it, and that might have helped a little bit. I don't really know how much though. The primer went on pretty clean as it was, it's kind of uh, up in the air how much of a difference that would have made. But as you can see, I'm just carefully trying to remove any extra color, any kind of messiness from my previous paint, uh, paint steps. And I'm just gonna do that on all the white trim all the way around the building top to bottom. And while I'm waiting for all that to dry, it's time to go back and touch up some of the extra details. So here I have my two barrels. Uh, that are going to be trash barrels and i've already got them base coated in that hobby paint silver um, they're obviously much too bright as is so i'm going to darken those down and kind of add a little bit of a weathering to them and i'm just going to do that using some uh, citadel null oil and i just apply a really heavy really thick coat of this all the way around i make sure i get a little bit around the inside of the rim and i make sure that i get around all of the nooks and crannies around the brand uh, the banding the banding that goes around the outside of the barrels. I want that to stand out. So I just take my time, get it all over there. It's not a very difficult or time consuming process. Just kind of slather it on and move on. So after I've got the trash barrels done, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the picnic table that I built using uh, coffee stirs and toothpicks. And I wanna just make that a natural looking wood grain without having to really cover up the detail of what I've already done to it. So instead of going into a crazy amount of detail painting this, 
I just give it a heavy wash with uh, Seraphim Sepia from Citadel. And what this does, I find, is it brings out the natural wood grain in the coffee stirrer without having to add a ton of extra texture with a hobby knife or anything or any extra carving. I just paint this on real thick. It gives a nice finished product. Um, the only downside to this on both the barrels and on the uh, picnic table is when you paint on these washes like this, this heavy, they take a long time to dry. So keep that in mind if you're in a rush for something. Um, if I would have actually painted this with a hobby paint, it would have been dry a lot faster than it was after the, um, after the wash. Moving right along, the next step is to go around and get all of the metal bits like the door shutters with this uh, folk art brushed metal black. Um, it gives a nice metallic color that's really dark and dingy. Uh, it gives it kind of a really industrial look, which I was going for, for the ground floor where the windows are shuttered and the doors are like these heavy security doors. So here, again, I'm just carefully painting this on. I'm using a junk hobby brush, one because this is a hobby paint, so it's already thick and kind of nasty. And then on top of that, it's a metallic, so it's got all the metallic flake in it that can kind of mess up a good brush. So here, I'm just being careful, I'm going around and I end up having to do a bunch of touch up work around these. It's just part of it. I'm not that clean of a painter a lot of time and I have to backtrack a lot. It's part of it. But anyway, just go around, be careful, be as clean as you can, get a nice thin even coat all the way across. Sometimes you'll have to go back over the white because it is white and uh, add some extra detail. But here I'm just being careful to get into every little crevice, nook and cranny and uh, just paint all the way around all the metal bits on the ground floor. Next up, I'm getting on to one of my favorite steps and that's adding the ground texture to the exterior surfaces of the upper two floors. So I decided the outdoor patio area here is gonna be like a gravel surface. And so I'm using one of my junk brushes and some half and half watered down PVA, just plain Elmer's white glue all. And I'm spreading that on in a nice even coat. I don't want it to be really thick or puddly, but at the same time, I want it to make sure it's got some, a little bit of a depth to it, so it'll hold on to the gravel that I'm gonna pour in. So the next product I'm gonna be using is Woodland Scenics Ballast. Um, I've got it, cause the original package kind of exploded on me from uh, years of use. I've got it in a Ziploc, and I'm just using a spoon to control it a little better than just dumping it all in. So here I'm just scooping out a little bit at a time and then sort of sifting it into the areas I want it. And I'm trying to get a smooth kind of surface to it. I don't want it to be real clumpy. Uh, and I just take my time and use a brush to fan it out if I need to, uh, to kind of spread it around and um, get it off the details around the building. So I just take my time, make sure I try and keep it nice and tidy and uh, be patient with it. And next up, I'm doing the upper uh, roof level. I'm using uh, the same method for the glue. Uh, the difference is this time, instead of using uh, the ballast, I'm gonna be using Woodlick, Woodland Scenic Flock, but I'm doing it the same way. I'm using a spoon and I'm just kind of ladling it out and sort of sifting it on into the kind of the thickness that I want. Um, the flock doesn't come off the spoon quite as well as the ballast did, but you can still use the bottom side of the spoon to spread it around and get it to where you want it. And here I'm just being careful to get all the way around the edges up against the rail. And I'm doing this in sections, two halves basically um, on the top because it's a bigger surface and I didn't want my glue to dry before I got to it with the, uh, with the flock. So I'm just carefully spreading it around I don't really care if it goes over the edge too much. That just seems like it'll be a little bit of realistic sort of wear and tear on the turf because um, this is gonna end up being a rooftop garden. So that's where I was at with this and I'm just spreading the flock on. So where we're at now is uh, we've got the details painted and primed and everything's ready to start attaching it to the base model. Uh, we've got the flocking done. Um, as you can see, the turf turned out really nicely. The uh, Ground cover on the um, patio area turned out nice. The ladders are all painted up and ready to go. And now we're gonna start adding some uh, some more details. Um, so we've got the car painted up and as you can see, I've done some testing on the car actually. Uh, I used uh, some Avery brand uh, printable decals to try and get some, 
stuff printed, but that didn't work out very well. Um, the way our printer here works, it can't print white or it doesn't have that sort of, um, it can't print bright white colors or light colors. So anything that I tried to do that with turned out really patchy and didn't turn out well. It worked okay over the black or over the white rather because uh, it gave it a background you could see it on. But for the other parts, I had to do what I'm getting ready to do here, which is kind of decoupage really. Uh, when you get right down to it, you take a uh, thin PVA or Mod Podge, you paint it onto your surface, and then you just apply your paper, and then you paint back over the top of it as well. What this does is it bonds your paper to your surface. In this case, I'm doing the vending machines. I'm doing a um, Boss Coffee vending machine because it was one of my favorite beverages while I was in Japan. I drank a lot of it. They have it in vending machines all over the place. Um, there's the added bonus that this particular one has uh, one of their ad campaigns had Tommy Lee Jones as a spokesperson. So he's featured on my vending machines for Boss Coffee on this. No, this isn't a paid advertisement. Boss probably has no idea who I am or what I'm doing. And neither does Tommy Lee Jones. And that's okay. So anyway, I'm just carefully cutting out um, the parts that are going to be on the vending machine. I'm using my hobby knife here so I can trim off as close to the actual signage as I can. And once I've got that done, I'll start gluing them onto the vending machine. So I've turned the uh, building up on its side so I could get to the uh, vending machine a little better. And here I've just got my um, first piece of the signage that I'm gonna put on there. And I've got it stuck to the end of my hobby knife, but I end up knocking it off, which is a little inconvenient. But basically I'm doing exactly what I said. I've got the little puddle of uh, watered down PVA there off to the side. I've got my brush with my water on it and I'm just using my hobby knife to help me get this where I want it and position it. So I'm just real careful. I've got a thin layer painted on the back of it. I'm sticking it into place and I end up using my finger to just hold it down and make it match the curvature of the vending machine itself. And I continue on doing more of the same. I just carefully go through and place each of these um, pieces of signage onto the vending machine the same way and repeat that process until they're all done. So after finishing the signage on the vending machine, I've gone around and I've painted out some details onto the doors as well um, and onto the AC units. I've done the metallic on the AC units and on the doors, I've done a light blue for the touch pads for the security codes and I've done a dark blue, the midnight blue from Citadel for the windows on those doors as well. I also hit the numbers on the um, what I decided were the cues for the uh, walk-up window on the front of the building. And now that that's done, we're ready to move on to the next step. Similar to the last video where I did the interior of the building, now I'm adding some touches of life to the exterior. I've got my picnic table here and I've decided I'm gonna put a couple of newspapers uh, glued down to the top of it so they uh, look like people were sitting there at the time of evacuation. So I'm just gonna do this the same way I've done the rest of it. I use a little bit of watered down PVA and a wet brush and I just paint it onto the back of the paper how I want it. This one I've got folded so it looks like it's kind of laying over the edge of the picnic table. And then I just stick it into place and I'll go through and do this for the uh, other piece that I've got there as well and uh, add some other touches as well. Well, I'm adding trash to the trash can by the vending machine now, and at this point, as I'm editing the video, I realize that somehow I have deleted or lost the footage I had of making the little bushes you see, the flower bushes up on the uh, garden on the first, or on the top floor. Um, those were made using Woodland Scenics products. There's a uh, moss and then uh, flowers, uh, like dried flower petals that I picked up at... Um, Hobby Lobby, I believe it was. I've used them previously in other builds, but um, here you can see I've got the picnic table finished. I've got a couple soda cans on it, as well as the newspapers. And now I'm just using super glue to fix it to the um, to the patio area down there. Uh, I'm sorry about missing the uh, misplacing the footage of finishing the garden on the roof, but it really wasn't that difficult. Uh, the only material that I use that's not one of the standard ones I've talked about previously is probably the reindeer moss type stuff uh, that I used for the majority of the bushes. Um, it's easy to work with. You just use the standard white PVA watered down. Uh, maybe at some point I'll circle back and do another video tutorial about how to make flower bushes. 
because I'll be definitely using more of those in the uh, Neo Nicoya project as it goes on. Next up, we're going to continue with the uh, attaching the exterior details. And here I'm just going to be sticking on the ladders so that um, characters and models have a way to travel between the different levels of the building. So I'm just using super glue. And as you can kind of see there on the print, I left little pegs as attachment points sticking off of the backside of the um, of the ladder itself. And those are where most of the uh, contacts going to be. So I'm putting super glue on each one of those and then I'll just press them into place and hold them until they set up a little. And I'll just be doing the same thing on the back of the building. I've already got the super glue in there. So I just get it centered in the gap in the railing and then press it into place. Um, as you can see, I also, one of the decals that the Avery print did work for is the uh, graffiti there on the back of the building. I thought it'd be kind of cool to put a piece of graffiti on the back of the police station. So that's marked in there. And this is pretty much the finished building. Um, and the last little bit of detail I wanted to add is I wanted to weather up the uh, pavement a little bit. So here I've got some homemade wash. It's just a little bit of black ink with some uh, medium, some flow aid and some water to help, uh, help it run more like a wash. And I'm just gonna liver, very liberally paint this onto uh, the pavement all the way around. I wanna especially focus on where the car's gonna be parked or in that front area where it's gonna be heavily worn. And then I'm gonna go all the way around the edge as well and make sure it's uh, all the way around the pavement, kind of the pad that the building sets on. So I'm just gonna take my time and do that. And it doesn't really matter. Uh, the biggest thing I don't wanna do is leave any big puddles, but it's not even a big deal if I do. So as we're putting the last finishing touches on this and uh, adding the wash to the pavement, I just wanna go ahead and take this time to thank Titan Forge Miniatures for letting us use their products. Um, their 3D models from their Patreon are fantastic. They're just starting up a new product line uh, and their own game uh, called Bloodfields, I think it is. And uh, there's a Kickstarter that's going to be going on for that that starts here in the next day or two. And then here in a month or so, they're going to be running a um, running a side Patreon. They're going to start a second one that's just going to be um, Cyberforge or something to that nature, where instead of the um, Titan Forge is going to focus mostly on the fantasy side of things, and then the Cyberforge side of it is going to be sci-fi, cyberpunk, uh, modern, that sort of thing. Anything a little more futuristic, modern will fall under that. And I'm looking forward to becoming a part of that as well. So uh, you should definitely check those guys out there. Uh, I'll have links to their Patreon and to their website in the description below. Not going to lie, waiting for that last round of washes and glue to dry was one of the most patience testing things I've ever done. But it's almost time for the big reveal. Here you can see all the work done on the outside. You can see all the details on the ground floor doors and the trash cans down there and the pavement. You can see that there's trash in the trash can. The vending machine's got everything on it. The signage is all nice and neat. Uh, the garden on the rooftop looks good. The AC units look good. And now we get to start peeling away the tape so you can see the interior of the building. And this was a really rewarding moment. Uh, it felt like a lot of hard work and a lot of effort to get this all put together had come in and really just really rewarding moment here. So if you've enjoyed the video, if you've enjoyed this project and uh, are enjoying how it turned out, and if you learned anything, be sure to give a like and a subscribe, a comment if you've got questions or suggestions for other projects coming up in the future. Uh, follow us on other, face or on other social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, Instagram gets daily updates with what we're up to. Twitter gets live tweets um, whenever we're working on big projects like this. And uh, Facebook's where we make all of our big announcements. So coming up next week, we're going to do some street scatter terrain like roadblocks and debris uh, barricades and stuff like that. So if you want to catch that as the Neo Nagoya project rolls on, be sure to hit the bell for the notification icon here on YouTube. And you'll uh, be updated when those videos are up and running. And if you'd like to contribute to the development of Seer in these YouTube videos and uh, otherwise help out with Clock Tower Game Studio, you can support us on Patreon. I'll be reworking those reward tiers actually this month. And I've got a little bit of an added, um, added 
reward system coming up for next month planned. Uh, instead of just a monthly mission, I'm going to add on to it with a little bit of fiction and uh, lower the cost a little bit, I think. But you can support us on Patreon. Uh, you can also uh, tip us by buying us cups of coffee on Buy Me a Coffee. And of course, there's um, the Amazon affiliate links you can use to buy materials and tools used to make these videos. As always, thank you all very much for watching. And at the Clock Tower, it's always game time.